Okay, we're ready to go. Thank you so much for your patience. And I'm sorry that we were not able to fix the mics. So Katie and I are both gonna talk loudly. Luckily, both of us are fantastic projectors. Um, but do do just, you know, if you can't hear us uh, in the back, please uh, move closer and or let us know, wave your arms and 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 we'll try to we'll try to raise the volume. So let me start by just saying welcome. Uh, it's really great to have you all here. Uh, my name is Rita Wexler. I am the director of the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology here at Stanford. So that's basically where we do astrophysics and cosmology uh, at Stanford. So I know many of you are uh, regulars at our public lecture series, but I, I expect some of you are new and here partially because you're fans of Katie or because you just want to know about the end of the universe, which is also one of my favorite topics. Um, so um, we have been doing public lectures at KaiPak for a very long time, but we've been ramping up and we are now uh, rejuvenating uh, to, a, to a monthly series. So I hope we will see many of you again. Um, I am going to pass this off, I think, to Sinan, who's going to tell you a few things um, before I introduce our speaker. So uh, welcome to Sinan, who helps run the public lecture series. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all so much for joining us either in person or online. We also have a very large concurrent uh, viewing crowd online and really, really sorry about the technical issues we're running into. Um, but I, before Risa introduces our speaker today, I also wanted to acknowledge um, all the staff members that who helped us to make this possible. And for the online audience, I would really like to have the chance to have you meet some of our chat moderators who will be answering most of your questions online tonight. So I'm gonna give them a chance to introduce themselves very quickly. Um, we'll start with Phil. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Dr. Phil Mansfield. Uh, I'm a postdoc who works at Stanford University, although I'm in Chicago right now, and I study what happens when galaxies are destroyed by even bigger galaxies. Great, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, next, we have uh, Elise. Hi, I'm Elise. Um, I'm a graduate student at Stanford, and I like thinking about how our galaxy, the Milky Way, formed. Very cool. And last but not least, we have Mahalat. Hi, I'm Mahalat. I'm also a graduate student, and I'm interested in thinking about um, large scale structure formation in the universe. Great, thank you. So all those uh, chat moderators, they are online and we'll be answering most of the questions that we get from the online audience. And the remaining questions will be um, answered during the Q&A, which is after Katie's presentation. Um, and all of you also know that we have a book raffle today, which will happen after the Q&A. And for the in-person attendees, hopefully you have already dropped your raffle ticket into the box. And we will do a separate online raffle um, after we wrap up the, the Q&A. So with that, I'll turn it back to Risa to introduce Katie. Okay, thank you. All right, so it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Katie Mack. So Katie is a, a theoretical astrophysicist and cosmologist, which means she works on almost everything from the beginning of the universe to the end of the universe um, and what the universe is made of, one of my favorite topics, dark matter, as well as the very beginning of the universe, uh, how, how light first forms in the universe and what it does when that happens, a process called reionization. Um, Katie and I were trying to remember actually when we met each other, and it seems like we've always known each other, but uh, we've crossed paths many, many times over the years, uh, partially through our public engagement work. Um, Katie is, uh, as you all may know, uh, very popular on Twitter. I just checked she's the second most followed physicist on, on Twitter. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but, the, but the first most followed woman and physicist and astronomer, which are separate lists that she's on both of. Um, anyways, but she also uh, does really fascinating research. She currently holds the Hawking Chair in Cosmology and Science Communication 
I believe she's the inaugural holder of that uh, really exciting position um, at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. Um, she's previously held positions um, at Cambridge in the UK, uh, in North Carolina, in North Carolina, in Australia. So she's been all over. Um, and as, as I'm sure many of you know, she's the author of the book, The End of Everything. Uh, she's a very prolific writer for a number of science publications. And the thing that continuously amazes me about Katie is she can explain anything in astrophysics well beyond you know, her own work, which is really fantastic. So we're really lucky to have her here at KAIPAC this week. Uh, we've been uh, delighted already to learn about some of her current research and we'll hear more about that this week. But now, uh, without further ado, let me pass it off to Katie. Thank you, Katie. Hello. Um, I will. I will do my best to project. Uh, let me know if it's uh, if you don't hear me. Um, let me get this screen share started. All right, so um, I will be talking about the end of the universe, which is one of my favorite subjects. Um, and I will begin by uh, let's see. all of the technical difficulties today. <laughs> no. OK. Um, so I'll begin here. Uh, most of the time when people talk about the end, uh, they're really talking about the end of the world. So this is one of my favorite images of the Earth, by the way. This is from Apollo 17. And it's one of the images that really brought home how, um, how fragile and how alone our world is in the cosmos. And so we often wonder, you know, how is the world going to end? Is it going to be ice? Is it going to be fire? Um, it's fire. So uh, somewhere, somewhere in that range, the sun will be so bright that it will boil off the ocean of the earth and leave the earth a charred lifeless rock. So that's sorted. I'm interested in the bigger picture. Maybe when the earth is gone, we will have already spread out into the stars. We will be living uh, in other galaxies. What what happens when that all ends? What happens with when the entire universe is over? So in this talk, I'll go through four different possibilities: the big crunch, the heat death, the big rip, and my personal favorite, vacuum decay. So to orient us, we live in a galaxy. Uh, we live in the Milky Way galaxy. This is an image. Uh, of the Milky Way taken from the southern hemisphere, so you can see the center of the Milky Way. Um, because we are inside the Milky Way, it looks uh, like a strip across the sky. If we were outside the Milky Way, it would look similar to this. This is actually our nearest neighbor large galaxy, the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, it's a disc-shaped galaxy like our own with a bulge of stars in the center, spiral arms. And when we look out into the universe, we see that it is filled with galaxies. Um, we see that even more now that we have the James Webb Space Telescope. We can see images like this where the universe is just full of, of galaxies. Everywhere you look, every tiny piece of sky has tens of thousands of galaxies in it. And you can zoom in in images like this. And in a picture like this, virtually everything you see here is a galaxy in the distant universe. You know, all of these little smudges. The things with the with the bright um, bright lines on them, those are stars that got in the way. Pretty much everything in here is a galaxy. This one's my favorite in this picture. Um, they're all out there in the distant universe, um, and they're so far away that their light has taken billions of years to reach us. And I'll get back to that. And when we look at these images, we 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 get kind of two things out of them. One one is that we see these galaxies that are so distant that their light is taken, in some cases, almost the entire age of the universe to reach us. The other thing we see is that galaxies are moving away from us because the universe is expanding. They're not just moving away from us, they're moving away from each other. 
Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, online people. Sorry about that. I was pacing. <laughs> um, I will stay closer to the podium so that the online people can hear me. Um, yeah, so we see that the galaxies are moving away from each other as the universe is expanding. And the farther away a galaxy is from us, the faster it is moving away from us because there's more space in between us. And so there's more space expanding. And so as we look out, we see this expansion going on everywhere in the universe. And the other thing that we see, is, as I said, is that we see deep into the past because we're seeing things that are so far away that their light has taken a long time to get to us. Anytime we look at anything, we're looking into the past, really. So, you know, light takes about a nanosecond to travel just a foot. So even if you're looking at something a foot away, you're looking at a nanosecond in the past. If I look at uh, the front row here, I'm looking at maybe 30 or 40 nanoseconds in the past. If I look at the sun, eight minutes, another galaxy can be millions or billions of years ago. And so as we look at some of these very distant galaxies, we're looking at galaxies that lived at a time when the universe was younger, when there was when the universe was closer to the beginning of time. And so we can we can make uh, diagrams like this, where we have, you know, the progression from. Um, so if this worked, I would point. To, okay, um, so we have you know sort of the Hubble Space Telescope maybe over here, and as we look at deeper images of the universe. Uh, from, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see things that are so far away that the, the universe is only maybe half a billion years old when that light reached, when the light left that place. With JWST, we can actually see closer to, to when the universe was about 200 million years old. So some of the very earliest things in the universe. And as we go, as we look farther and farther away, we get to a point where there are no galaxies anymore because we're looking so far into the past. And we, we end up looking so far into the past that we can see a time when the universe was in a very different situation. So if the universe is currently expanding, that means it was much smaller in the past. If everything is getting farther away, it was much closer in the beginning. As the universe expands, it cools. In the beginning, it was hotter. And we can look back so far that we can see a time when the whole universe was hot and dense. When the sky wasn't dark, it was glowing with heat from the plasma of the primordial fire of the Big Bang. And we can actually see that as we look farther, far enough away in any direction, we can see the light from the time when the universe was glowing. And it looks kind of like this. This is, a, this is a false color version of that light. The light is in the microwave part of the spectrum, so it's actually microwave frequencies, but this is a, um, a colored version of, of that. Now, there, is, there are some features in it if you stretch the contrast, but it's basically the same color everywhere in the sky. The light, you get this glow of microwave light. Then there are some interesting things about it. One is the spectrum of this light. So the spectrum of the light is just telling you sort of how much light is in different colors of this microwave radiation. So in this case, you know, there's a sort of peak at a, a particular color of microwave light. There's a little less at, um, at a redder color and a little less at a bluer color. This is all in the microwave part of the spectrum. So you kind of have to shift these colors around. But it traces this particular curve, which we call a black body curve. And a black body curve is a special kind of spectrum of light. It's the kind of spectrum of light that's produced by anything that's just glowing because it's hot. So if you just take a poker and you stick it in the fire, it'll glow with heat and it'll make a black body curve. Now the black body curve that we saw with the cosmic microwave background is the most perfect black body curve ever, ever measured. In this case, on this diagram, there are little boxes on each of those little dots. And those are the, the, the uncertainties and the measurements, but they're blown up by 400 times so you can see them because otherwise it would be within the width of that line. And what that tells us is that when we look at this radiation coming from the early universe, it's radiation that's coming from the, uni the, the a universe that is just glowing because it's hot. And we can so we can take this picture, we can stretch out the contrast a little and we start to see some features. So if we try and see features by stretching out the contrast, so we can see differences in, in the, the radiation at, at one part in 100,000 in temperature, we can start to see that the un early universe wasn't just all one uniform temperature, there were 
places where a little bit hotter and a little bit colder. And we can keep we can keep uh, getting higher resolution images of this and higher resolution images of this. And this is the, the whole sky in microwave frequencies with sort of the galaxy removed from it to, to make it um, so we can see the whole thing. And this is from the, the Planck satellite. And, and when we look at these tiny little fluctuations, what we're seeing is places where the universe was a little bit more dense or a little bit less dense in the very, very beginning when the universe was just full of hot plasma. And that, that hot, dense universe had, have, has these little ripples in it because it was so dense that it was actually loud. There was sound traveling through this hot, dense plasma, sound waves crashing together and, and vibrating through this hot plasma state. And these little bumps we see are the remnants of those sound waves as, as plasma is moving around and oscillating in that hot, dense universe. And so by looking at these images, we can learn something about the very beginning of the universe, but we also learn a lot about the universe as a whole, partially because we have to look through everything in the universe to see that, because it's really at the edge of our vision. It's at the edge, it's the farthest, the most distant thing we can see. It's kind of a backlight to the entirety of the cosmos. And also because by examining the features here, we can learn something about the shape of the universe and the components of the universe that we can fit to models. And we can learn something about how the universe began and potentially about how it can end. So I'll get to one of the first um, ideas for that ending part, which is the big crunch. And this is a very simple idea. It's one of the, the ideas about the, the end of the universe that's been popular over the years. It was thought to be the most likely in the, in the 60s. The idea here is that if the universe is expanding, galaxies are getting farther away, what's to, how do we know if the universe is gonna keep expanding forever or turn around? What happens if that expansion suddenly reverses and everything's getting closer again? The natural conclusion is that the universe would get very, very crowded and a number of things would happen. If the expansion reversed, the first thing that would happen that we would notice is that galaxies would start to get really close together and they would start to collide with each other. They would start to interact with each other. And this is something that does happen in the modern day universe. We do see collisions of galaxies, not because the universe is necessarily contracting, but just because galaxies tend to be born near each other. Um, in places where there's a little bit more density, uh, there are a little bit more galaxies born there. And so they tend to, to come together. And there are entire catalogs you can find of interacting galaxies where you can see these, uh, galactic train wreck collisions where the galaxies come together and they fling out streams of stars. And as they come together, the, the gas within the galaxies crashes together and you get bursts of new star formation and you know black holes can spiral in together and create um, jets of radiation stretching out um, into the universe. So it can be a very violent uh, thing when galaxies collide with each other. And whatever happens with the entirety of the universe, we are gonna get a firsthand view of galaxy collisions because of, of this. So this is the Andromeda galaxy that I mentioned before, and it is coming for us. Um, it is moving toward us at about 110 kilometers a second. It'll take about 4 billion years to reach us, but it will eventually hit. It might kind of swirl around a little bit, but we are on a collision course with Andromeda. And there's there's been some cool um, uh, simulations of what that'll look like. So this is a kind of, present day-ish view of Andromeda, where you can see that little smudge up there in the corner, that's Andromeda. And then you move forward a little bit in time and it gets a little bit bigger and a little bit closer and a little bit closer and then, oh no. And you can see in these, uh, in these uh, simulations that that red and blue um, color in there, that's the bursts of star formation that are occurring as that, as that collision occurs. And then there, it'll kind of maybe zoom out again as it passes through once and, and whips around. And so you'll get these kind of streamers of stars. And then eventually it settles down and everything's just kind of a big elliptical mess of stars in the night sky. So that's, that's what happens to galaxies. But a galaxy collision is potentially a, a totally survivable thing. So as long as you're not in the center of one of those regions where the star bursts are happening, as long as you're, you know, the, the flinging off of the stars is not so violent that the planets get ripped off too. 
generally a solar system will make it through a galaxy collision without necessarily being destroyed. But in a big crunch, the galaxy collisions are, are, are not what kills the stars. There's something else that happens there, which is that when the matter is all getting more compressed, so is the radiation. So if there's less space for all the galaxies to be in and, and, and less space for all the matter to be in, then that means that all the radiation in the universe is also being compressed. And as it's being compressed, it's being hardened. So when you, when you compress the radiation, it's gonna shift to higher frequencies. Um, we know that in the current universe, as the universe is expanding, radiation is stretched out. So you know, visible light will be stretched out to infrared light, which is why the JWST telescope has uh, infrared capabilities so it can see really distant things where the universe has stretched out the light to infrared wavelengths. But if the universe is contracting, then, then that infrared light gets compressed to visible and then visible gets compressed to ultraviolet and then ultraviolet gets compressed to gamma and, and X-rays and, and you end up with, with harder radiation, more dangerous radiation and more of it in a smaller space. And it's been calculated that if a big crunch is, is happening, that at some point you get to a stage where the entire universe is so hot with just this ambient radiation that it can actually cook the surfaces of stars. And you can get thermonuclear explosions along the surfaces of stars just from the, the ambient radiation of space itself. And that's not survivable. But fortunately, it looks very unlikely that the big crunch will happen. Our, it, it appears that the more, the most likely end of our universe is something we call the heat death. And the heat death is a very simple idea, really. Our universe is expanding. And as our universe is expanding, there's more and more space in between everything. The universe is getting colder and darker and emptier over time. And there was a question for a long time of whether this expansion would continue and just empty out the universe, or if it would com compress again. And, and the, thing that, the thing that really answered that question was when in the late 90s, astronomers were, were setting about to measure the change in the expansion rate of the universe. So the idea was that the expansion is happening now. It was set off by the Big Bang, whatever that was. And it started out very fast. And then as the universe expanded, the, the expansion was slowing. And it's, it makes sense that it should slow because all of the galaxies are moving apart from each other, but they still have gravity. So they're still pulling on each other. So they should be sort of putting the brakes on that expansion. And so that was happening for, for billions of years. The universe was expanding, but it was slowing down because all these galaxies were pulling on each other and kind of slowing the, that expansion. And so in the late, late 1990s, astronomers were trying to figure out how quickly is that expansion slowing down? They wanted to measure the deceleration parameter this number that would tell them how quickly the expansion rate was slowing down. Because if it, if, if it was slowing down very quickly, then that might mean that we were gonna stop and everything was gonna recollapse. If it was slowing down very slowly, then you know the universe might always be slowing, but it would, it would keep expanding forever just at a slower and slower rate. And they found something really weird, which is that it wasn't slowing down at all. The universe was in fact speeding up in its expansion. And this is, this is very unexpected. This is like if you if you throw a ball up in the air, normally you'd expect that you throw a ball up in the air and because you gave it a push and then gravity is pulling on it, gravity makes it uh, you know slow down as it's rising. At some point it stops and it falls down. But even if you threw it fast enough to escape the earth, if you threw it 11.2 kilometers a second, it would always feel the gravity of the earth and it would always be slowing down even as it's coasting off into space. It would be very weird if you take a ball and you throw it into the air and it slows down for a little, little while and then it shoots off into the sky. You would think that something grabbed it or there was a sudden wind or maybe it has a, a motor in it or you would expect that something weird is happening. It's not just gravity at that point. But in the universe, we don't know what there could be other than gravity. It's really supposed to just be the expansion and gravity, the general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity is supposed to govern everything. And so astronomers had to contend with the fact that something was making the universe expand faster. And we don't know what that is still. Uh, this was the acceleration of the universe was discovered in the late 90, 90s. We still don't know why. Whatever is making the expansion happen faster and faster, we call it dark energy. Um, it's possibly 
something called the cosmological constant, which is something that Einstein originally wrote into his equations of the, of the, the evolution of, of the universe that would just kind of balance out the gravity and make every little bit of space have a little bit of stretchiness in it, essentially. And so as the universe gets bigger, there's more and more stretchiness and that kind of overcomes the gravity eventually and makes the universe expand faster. So that might be what it is. And if it is, then we know how the universe is gonna end. Because what that would say is that the universe will continue to accelerate in its expansion. It'll continue to get bigger and darker and emptier. And eventually our galaxy will be alone in the universe or whatever's left of our galaxy after the collision with Andromeda. And in this big dark empty universe, at some point, it'll be impossible to see other galaxies. So in about 100 billion years, if you take JWST or the Hubble Space Telescope and you point it out into the sky, it'll just be darkness. You might, you'll see the other stars in our own galaxy, although those will be fading. In 100 billion years, there'll be very few stars left burning in our galaxy and no other galaxies will be visible. We won't be able to see the cosmic ray background. It'll be a dark, empty universe. And then the stars in our own galaxy will eventually die. The black holes will evaporate and lose their radiation off into space. Matter will decay and the universe will be left cold, dark, and empty. That's called the Hita of the universe. And it's a very sad story. Um, I, I have a colleague who says that when she talks about the Hita of the universe, people cry. <laughs> Um, but I do, I do want to say that it could be worse. <laughs> so the nice thing about, so, so the, the heat death is, uh, is, is very gentle in the sense that it, it moves galaxies away from each other, but it doesn't disturb them because co the cosmological constant really only, only deals with the space between galaxies. It doesn't mess with things with, objects themselves. The universe is expanding, this room is not expanding. But the big rip involves a kind of dark energy that is much more, uh, much more disruptive. So um, going back to the idea of the cosmological constant. So when, when Einstein came up with the cosmological constant, the basic idea was that there's a lot of stuff out there in the universe. He knew about stars, he didn't know about other galaxies at the time he came up with this, but it works either, either way. Imagine you have a bunch of galaxies in the universe, they're all, they're all pulling on each other with gravity. And at the time when Einstein was coming up with this, he didn't know the universe was expanding. He thought it was kind of just the same all the time. It was just in a steady state. And he didn't know why all those galaxies hadn't all crashed into each other already, if the universe really is just in a steady state, that gravity should have pulled it all together. So he came up with this extra term in his equations, which would just balance it all out. It would put the stretchiness into the universe. It would kind of push against the gravity and everything would be stable and just still. And, the, uh, the th and when it was found that the universe is actually expanding, um, Einstein threw out that, that cosmological constant and we didn't need it again until we found out that it's accelerating. And so we do need something actually to push on the galaxies to stretch out space. But if it is a cosmological constant, then the constant part of it is the density. So every piece of space has a certain amount of expansion built into it. And so if the universe gets bigger, there's more of that expansiveness, there's more of the cosmological constant, but the amount per unit volume, the amount in each cubic meter is the same. Um, and that's that's a bit of a weird thing because everything else uh, in the universe, the density will change with time because the volume of the universe is getting bigger. So for example, with matter, as the universe gets bigger, the density of matter goes down with time. So you have a box of, of stuff, you make that box twice as big, now the density is half as much because the density is the mass per unit volume. So the matter uh, decreases, uh, diffuses and decreases with time. The radiation, goes down even faster because not only is it being distributed to, in more space, it's also being stretched out to lower energies. And so both matter and radiation go down with time in a universe that's expanding. But if you have a cosmological constant, it's just constant with time because it's just a property of the space itself. And so when you, if you have a universe with a cosmological constant, then one of the things you notice there is that as time goes on, eventually everything else kind of fades away 
and all that's left is is this dark energy, this cosmological constant dark energy. But it's just it's just stays the same over time. There's a there's a hypothetical kind of dark energy called phantom dark energy where the density of it actually increases with time, which means that in in the same sort of volume of space, instead of having the same amount of dark energy over time, it'll have more dark energy in it, which means that in this room, there's a certain amount of dark energy in this room. If it's a cosmological constant, it's the same amount of cosmological constant there ever was in this room. So when the when the building was built, it was already taking into account whatever the cosmological constant was doing to the space within. If you have phantom dark energy, then the amount of dark energy is building up in this room over time. And eventually that's gonna start putting a strain on the space that this room is in. And it's gonna start trying to expand this room. So in a universe with phantom dark energy, as time goes on, not only do galaxies move away from each other, they start to be pulled apart from within. So galaxies would start to be pulled away from clusters of galaxies, stars would be pulled away from galaxies, uh, solar system, uh, solar systems would be pulled apart. Um, from our perspective, we would see the stars drifting away from our, our galaxy. We would see the outer planets moving off into space. We would lose the moon and then the earth would explode and the entire universe would be at some finite time in the future, completely torn apart. Now it's kind of a, it's not, it's not an accepted theory. It's a bit of a, of a speculative idea, but it's accepted enough that, that a few years back, um, NASA made a, an animation to show us what this would look like. Uh, and here's, here's their animation. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just play that again. So you have the expansion starts, you know, the universe, the galaxies are getting farther away and then everything's torn apart. Now, we have ways to test, well, to, to kind of figure out whether the, the, um, the dark energy is this phantom dark energy or a cosmological constant. And generally we are measuring a parameter called the equation of state parameter, which is telling us something about the ratio between the, the pressure and the density of whatever the stuff is that's making the universe expand so fast. And I won't go into the, the details of it, but if the universe has a cosmological constant, if the dark energy is a cosmological constant, then this number is, is negative one. If it's anything less than negative one, that indicates phantom dark energy. So that's kind of the borderline case, right? And we can measure this W by measuring things about the properties of the sort of distribution of galaxies in the universe, looking at the expansion rate in the past and, and so on. And uh, we, we got some data for this from the Planck satellite in 2018, um, trying to measure this, this number W. And uh, it was negative uh, 1.028 plus or minus 0 0.032. So that is, that is a little less than negative one. But you shouldn't be concerned, of course, because this error bar, this plus or minus 0 0.038 means that it's it's certainly very possible that we are exactly at negative one. And that's kind of the, uh, the default hypothesis that we are in a cosmological constant universe. Just because the best fit value is a little bit below that doesn't mean, you know, it's not statistically significant. But what we can do is we can say, okay, if we have the, the lowest possible uh, W, is that you know negative 1.028 minus 0 0.032. That's the lowest possible W that fits with the data right now. Then we can use that to calculate when the big rip will happen if we do have phantom dark energy. And so we can get something like 188 billion years. So we have at least that long, right? The universe is not gonna pull itself apart within that amount of time. And that's a long time, 100, about 100 billion years, we're already losing all the other galaxies. There's no point in hanging out anyway. Uh, might as well let the universe rip itself apart. There is one final possibility that technically could happen at any moment. So vacuum decay, as I mentioned before, is my personal favorite uh, because it has it has to do with a really fascinating connection between particle physics and the state of the universe itself. And it has a lot to do with the discovery of the Higgs boson. So in 2012, uh, the Large Hadron Collider was smashing protons together and they discovered evidence for the Higgs boson, which is a particle that was, was uh, said to be 
the final piece of the standard model of particle physics. It's something that has to do with how particles got mass in the early universe. So let me tell you about the standard model of particle physics first. So the standard model of particle physics is all of the particles we've ever seen or touched or interacted with, everything we've ever uh, detected in an experiment. So there's these ones and then the Higgs boson, which we found very happily in 2012. And um, I'll talk about the Higgs in a moment, but let me walk you through the rest of these. So the, the ones in the sort of blue and purple here, these are the quarks. So there's the, the quarks come in different flavors. They were up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. They were named in the 60s and 70s. Um, they, uh, the, the up and down quarks are the ones that make up the proton and the neutron. So you have two up quarks and down quark, you have a proton, two down quarks and up quark, you have a neutron. Those are the particles that live in the centers of atoms. Then in the green, you have the leptons. So there's the neutrinos, which are these kind of ghostly particles that are created in the in nuclear fusion. And then there's the uh, the electron um, and its its cousins, the, the muon and the tau. The electron is the, the one that kind of goes around the atom. Um, only when you when you study quantum mechanics, you find that it's not really circling the atom. It's kind of in a haze of electron probability in this around the atom. And then on the in the red, those are the gauge bosons. Those are the force carriers. Those are the particles that are that are responsible for um, mediating the forces of nature. So there's the photon, that's the particle of light. Um, it also does electromagnetism. Um, it does you know magnetism and electricity. Uh, there's the gluon, that's the particle that mediates the strong nuclear force. It holds the the um, particles together in the center of the nucleus of the atom. And then the W and the Z bosons, those ones have to do with things like nuclear uh, decay. They are the mediators of the weak nuclear force. So when we study all of these uh, particles together, we can learn something about, uh, about the, the sort of state of the universe. And specifically, we're learning something about the Higgs field. So I mentioned the Higgs boson, that's that particle there. The Higgs boson is not really the important thing. The important thing is the Higgs field. So the Higgs field is this energy field that pervades all of space. And it has some kind of uh, value to it. It has, it has like a number associated with it, um, a sort of amount of energy in it. And um, how much, uh, wh what the Higgs field is doing tells you something about kind of, uh, it kind of determines the, the, how the particles interact with each other, it determines something about the masses of the particles. Um, the Higgs field is something that uh, was, was set up in the very early universe and kind of just set the rules for how particle physics works in our universe. In the very beginning of the universe, the Higgs field was at a different value. And then there was a transition called um, uh, the electroweak symmetry breaking and that moves the Higgs field to a different value. So the value that the Higgs field has sort of sets the rules for, for particle physics, tells you how atoms will, will work, what particles exist in the universe that sets up the whole standard model of particle physics. So one question that particle physicists have is, okay, the Higgs field changed once, is it gonna change again? Because we have this nice setup where we have particles and forces that all fit together to make you know, atoms and molecules possible, we don't really want that to change. Um, but uh, based on our understanding of the equations, it's possible that it could. And so there are some measurements we can make to, to kind of feel out whether or not the Higgs field is likely to change. And so we can take things like the mass of the top quark and the mass of the Higgs boson, and um, we can use those to, to put together this diagram of different, different possibilities for the stability or instability of the universe based on whether or not the Higgs field is gonna stay where it is or if it's gonna change in the future. So for example, if the Higgs mass is 100 uh, GeV, GeV is a unit of energy, but we use it for mass for particles. Um, if the Higgs mass is 100 and the top mass is 50, then we're squarely in that stability region. The Higgs field will never change again. We're fine, the universe is safe. If the Higgs mass is 100 and the top mass is 200, the universe is so unstable it already collapsed. Um, we, we, we don't exist. Uh, if the Higgs mass is 200, top mass is 100, everything goes wrong with the equations, we kind of start over. So where, where do we live 
right now. Well, the measurements tell us we are there. So that's metastability. So stable for now, right? So metastable is like, you know, when you when you put something right on the edge of the table, right? It's like it's that's stable for now, right? You don't you don't want to mess with it. Um, eventually, it'll probably be on the floor, but for now, it's okay. Um, so just to show you kind of graphically what this looks like, so imagine. So this is the this is a, a diagram of the Higgs potential. So it's kind of kind of like uh, you can think of it like a like a gravity gravitational potential. So like um, you know the the lower of these two little uh, dips you can think of as like a lower energy state and the higher one is a higher energy state. And so just like you know the edge of this table is the higher energy state, the floor is the lower energy state. You can think of it kind of like that. And then the Higgs field is living in one of those little uh, little valleys, right? So if it's in the, the higher one, then that's called the false vacuum. So the vacuum state is the kind of state of the universe. The higher one is the false vacuum where the universe is metastable. If it lived in the in the lower one, that would be the true vacuum where the universe is stable. So so this is kind of the false vacuum state of the of the clicker down here. That would be the true vacuum state, right? So so what's wrong with living in a false vacuum state? Well, there, there are a couple of things that can go wrong there, right? One is that you could imagine something could happen that could uh, kick that Higgs field off into the other vacuum state. And to be clear, the, you don't want to live in a true vacuum. If, if we live currently in a false vacuum, we don't want to transition to the other one because the other one is a different value of the Higgs field, which means that all of physics is different. The particles have different masses or maybe no mass at all, or maybe too much mass. The, uh, the forces of nature don't exist in the way that they do now. The universe cannot hold together in a true vacuum if you transition from a false vacuum to a true vacuum state. On the bright side, as far as we know, it is not actually possible to shift the Higgs field into the true vacuum state. The, the, the kind of energy that would be required to kick it over that hill is so much that, that the universe doesn't seem to be capable of doing that. It's as though you could say, you know, that imagine that this thing is so heavy that even if I pushed with all my might, I could not get it to fall off onto the floor, right? So then you might think you're safe, but we live in a universe that is fundamentally governed by the rules of quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, you have a, a, a phenomenon called quantum tunneling, which is where if you have a solid wall, you put a, a particle on one side of that wall, if you wait long enough, eventually it'll be on the other side. And it didn't have to drill a hole, it didn't have to go around, it just appears on the other side. That's quantum tunneling. And that is a thing that happens all the time in at, at the subatomic world. And it applies not only to particles, but to fields like the Higgs field. I mean, technically, if you left this here long enough, it could quantum tunnel down to the floor. It would just be a very, very low probability, but it, it could do that. And unfortunately, uh, the Higgs field potentially could do that too, which means that, that at any moment, at some point in the universe, the Higgs field could transition to that true vacuum state where particles and uh, you know, molecules and atoms cannot exist. The, the forces of nature are different there. What would that look like? Well, at the place where that transition occurs, it would create a bubble of a true vacuum state. And that bubble would expand out at about the speed of light. And in that bubble, uh, the, the, the Higgs field would be different. Particles and, uh, could not hold together anymore. The forces of nature would be different. That would be an unlivable space. And because it's moving out at about the speed of light, if you're standing nearby when it happens, you're never going to see it coming. Now, I, there was a paper that, one of the first papers that really talked about this in detail in 1980 uh, was by Coleman and DeLuca. And I was reading this when I was a grad student and, and um, contemplating the, the possible um, destruction of the universe by vacuum decay. And they, had a, a, they did a calculation relating to this uh, topic where they, they worked out that within that bubble of true vacuum, um, not only 
are you, you know, disintegrated once the bubble hits you, but then the space inside the bubble is gravitationally unstable, which means that, that first you're, you're disintegrated and then you collapse into a black hole. Um, and they, they worked out that this was going to happen. They did a bunch of math and then they had a paragraph sort of reflecting on this. And, and it's, it's, it's this piece of physics poetry that's always kind of stayed with me. So I'll just, I'll just read you this, this one little paragraph. So they just did this calculation. They say, this is disheartening. <laughs> the possibility that we are living in a false vacuum has never been a cheering one to contemplate. Vacuum decay is the ultimate ecological catastrophe. In a new vacuum, there are new constants of nature. After vacuum decay, not only is life as we know it impossible, so is chemistry as we know it. However, one could always draw stoic comfort from the possibility that perhaps in the course of time, the new vacuum would sustain, if not life as we know it, at least some structures capable of knowing joy. This possibility has now been eliminated. So I should say here, I don't want you to worry about vacuum decay. And there, there are a few good reasons you should not worry about vacuum decay. Um, the most obvious is there's nothing you can do about it, of course. Um, the next most obvious is, is, is you wouldn't notice, right? Like it, it happens at the speed of light. You're not gonna see it coming. You're not gonna feel it. Your nerve impulses don't travel that fast. It would, you, you wouldn't even know that it occurred. But also we can calculate, we can't calculate exactly when it would happen, but we can calculate a, a decay time. We can calculate a, on average in, you know, a hundred universes, how often it would happen in a certain amount of time. We can say that the chance of it happening anytime in the next 10 to the power of a hundred years is minuscule. And that's a long time from now. That's long after, you know, uh, the, the galaxies are all destroyed and the, and the, and matter is decayed. So, it's probably not going to happen for a very long time, even if it can happen. I mean, it could happen technically at any moment, but it's almost certainly not going to happen anytime soon. The other reason not to worry about vacuum decay, though, is that when we look at what the universe is made of, we have we can we can work out what what all the sort of pieces of this pie are, and we see that most of the universe is dark energy, whatever that is, and we don't know yet what dark energy is. Then most of what's left is dark matter, which I didn't mention, but it's a kind of invisible stuff that holds galaxies together. And we don't know what that's made of either. And then there's just this little 5% slice here. And in that slice is the entire standard model of particle physics. Everything we've ever, we've ever seen or touched or interacted with lives in that little 5%. And the entire idea behind vacuum decay, behind the universe being metastable, relies on the standard model of particle physics being the whole picture, being the end of the story. If there's something else that changes the laws of physics, there's something else that some more complete model of particle physics out there, then it could potentially change the entire story. And because we know that dark matter exists and dark energy exists, or at least we're pretty sure, we're pretty sure that standard, the standard model is not the whole picture. So in order to really know how the universe is gonna end, we have to understand what all of these things are and we're working on it. <laughs> we have amazing new observatories, new experiments and new theories that are chipping away at these big mysteries. And hopefully it will give us a better idea of not only what, became, what came before, uh, but what will come next. Thank you. I personally am feeling really glad that we might have more than 188 billion years. So this is this is good news as far as, far as I'm concerned. We have to, I have to stay here or else they won't hear me. Okay, um, so we're going to take questions now. I'm going to alternate between questions from the crowd and questions from the Zoom. So let me start uh, if anyone to see if anyone from the crowd has a question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, can an end of the universe happen faster than the speed of light? Like it's 
or um, or or like if it's already happening and like uh, and we can't see it yet. And I mean, if it's happening at the speed of light, then if it's happening somewhere else. It, we still have to wait for it to get to us. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, so I think if you're asking about vacuum decay specifically, it is entirely possible that the vacuum bubble happened at Saturn half an hour ago, and it just hasn't got here yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's also possible that the vacuum bubble started beyond the uh, edge of our observable universe. So, in a part of our universe that that is moving away from us faster than the speed of light as the as the universe is expanding, in which case that bubble is not going to be a problem for us. And one might think that that would be comforting, but if the bubble could happen there, it could happen here too. And so over time, it kind of, there's the same probability of it happening anywhere in the universe. So you don't end up really getting saved by that. And you can do a calculation of if the bubbles are happening in different places. Um, although not all of space will be enveloped by a bubble, everything that's in space will eventually hit a bubble. Um, so, so unfortunately, <laughs> that doesn't quite save us. OK, we have a question from the online audience. Um, Macbeth Rheingold asks, how would a big crunch work thermodynamically? So would the entropy of the universe go up or down in that case? Uh, well, so I mean, so, so the universe, so this, the question is, uh, so I think the, the universe would get a lot hotter. And the and generally, when you're increasing the the temperature, you're increasing the entropy. Um, you're you're putting a lot more stuff in a smaller space, so you're you're constricting things in some ways. But but the total amount of of energy in each part of space is getting bigger. So I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure exactly how it balances out, but um, uh, it's it's complicated because gravitational things also have an entropy associated with them and that and I'm not sure how how you factor that in so so I, I, that's a good question I don't know um, entropy and en cosmology is generally a problem <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, trying to understand for example why the entropy of the universe is always going up uh, is a problem because we don't know why it should have been small at the beginning and and this is this is part of why people sometimes talk about cyclic models of the universe which I didn't talk about here but I do talk about in the book. Um, so that's that's a it's a an interesting question that we don't quite have an answer to yet. All right, we'll take a question from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, W greater than negative one is 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 totally possible. Um, but we don't have we don't have any like um, obviously interesting models that predict that for um, for like dark energy. So it's like the cosmological constant is negative one. We can put constraints on on how much bigger the negative one it can be. Um, but uh, that would just, that would end up being, you know, you're accelerating forever. You just don't have a cosmological constant. All right, we have a classic, but very interesting question from Leonard Tan online. I know that the universe is expanding, but what is it expanding into? Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, so that is a classic question. Um, the, the short answer is uh, we don't have any, um, we don't have any evidence that the universe is expanding into anything at all. So it could just be, it could be infinite and just getting more infinite. That is the thing that, that mathematically can happen with the universe. Um, it, it, it might be uh, finite and it might be expanding into a larger space, but we don't have any evidence for that. Uh, we don't have any evidence for there being an edge to the universe at all. What we have evidence for is there's stuff in the universe and that stuff is getting farther apart. And so we interpret that as expansion because everything's getting farther apart from everything else um, and there's more and more space. Um, but but it's, it's, it's like if you're inside a crowd and you can't see through the crowd, but you see that everybody's getting farther away from you, then you, you interpret that the crowd is expanding into, you know, it's, it's expanding, but you don't know if, it's, if that crowd is sort of circling the entire earth or, or if, it's, if it's leaving the room or, or what. Um, all you can do is say that, it must be expanding because everything's getting farther apart. That's that's what we see. All right. In the beginning of the lecture, you show this red level of distribution radiation. We talk about different parts of the universe. But we know that the part of the object here it has some red shape. The question is, will this red shape change this red level of radiation? 
Um, okay, so the question is about the black body radiation, um, and uh, because different different uh, objects have um, are in different places and moving differently, then then there there's some red shifting, and and does that change the black body? So so um, the 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 first thing is that that we do see so uh, there's there's this background radiation that's coming from every direction. The Earth, the Earth, and the, you know, like the galaxy, and you know the the solar system are moving in some direction relative to that radiation. So we actually do see a shift, a red shift in one direction, a blue shift in the other direction as we're moving toward the cosmic microwave background in one direction, away from it in the other direction. Um, that's called the dipole um, in the cosmic microwave background. So we do have to kind of subtract that out. But the background is coming from just the space. That is everywhere. So that space isn't moving relative. I mean, that, that space isn't really moving relative to everything else. It's just ambient space. And so it's not coming from objects, it's coming from space itself. So so we're moving through space, but that space isn't really moving relative to everything, if that makes sense. Okay, great. Uh we have another question from the online audience. Uh Paul Shin asks, um, there's this current controversy in cosmology, which is sometimes called the Hubble tension disagreement between how we're measuring the expansion rate uh, in, yeah. from the CMB and the local universe. Does that have any consequence for the end of the universe, for the fate of the universe? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. So yeah, so um, different kinds of measurements of the expansion rate give us different numbers. Um, and, uh, and there are some explanations for the Hubble tension that involve different kinds of dark energy, for example. Um, and so if, if the Hubble tension, if this, this disagreement is telling us something about the nature of dark energy, then that does have implications for the end of the universe. Um, it also might be telling us something about thing, weird things that happened in the early universe, which could tell us something about sort of the, our general cosmological model. Um, it could be telling us that our understanding of how the universe is evolving is wrong um, in some interesting way. Uh, so it could have implications for our understanding of the end of the universe. Um, but at the moment, uh, we we don't we don't yet know what's causing that disagreement, and it, it could be observational. It could be that some measurement is not right, or it could be that that we have to tweak something in our in our cosmology. Okay. Question in the front. Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, if the universe can end, um, uh, can it be reborn as well? And is is this maybe not the first universe? Um, so yeah, so so that's that's the the fifth scenario that I talk about in the book that I didn't talk about here. The idea that the universe might be cyclic in some way, um, and there are several theories that involve a previous universe leading into this one or a new universe after this one. Um, so there are some where where. The, the previous universe goes through a heat death and the new universe is born out of that. There are some that involve a compressing universe and a new universe is born out of that. There are some that have to do with kind of a, a, a previous like anti-universe that meets at the Big Bang with our universe. And then, so, so there are several um, ideas that are, that are being thrown around there. Um, but uh, so far they're, they're all kind of not, not as fully developed as, as our standard theory. Um, but for the purpose of, the book I considered an end to be any time when, when all of the structure in the universe that we live in now gets destroyed. <laughs> so, um, so whatever happens, uh, it's very unlikely that anything from this universe could persist into another one. Although a couple of those theories do possibly contain some kind of continuation, but it wouldn't be like, you know, civilization as we know it. For example, we had a couple of questions online about this uh, idea of the vacuum decay and if, is there any way to see it coming? So, you know, could it, could it have, could this vacuum, you know, have some sort of observable horizon or is that some chance it's going to create a shock or no? Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, the, the, the theory does seem to suggest that it moves basically at the speed of light. It's possible it could move very, very slightly slower if it's, if it's like transferring through some very dense medium, but space is not very dense. And so um, it, it seems very likely that it's either at the speed of light or very, very close to it um, in, in such a way that, that we would not see it coming. And, and if we did, we couldn't do anything about it anyway. So I'm not sure we want to see it coming. 
I, I have a question before sure. I ask one more from the audience. Um, so can it really happen at any moment? Well, because of, because it's a quantum tunneling event and because quantum tunneling is fundamentally uh, probabilistic, yeah, like there, we can't, you can't predict when a quantum tunneling event will happen. You can just give a, a sort of decay time of, of on average when it'll happen over a certain ensemble of universes. So, okay, I see one question from the youngest member of our audience. So I'm going to go with that one. Yep. So, so the question is, can the can the bubble decay? Like, as in, can it shrink? Or okay, okay. So the question is, can the vacuum bubble decay and shrink down? And if so, how does it come back and and expand again? Um, and um, so, so there is one scenario in which in which a bubble can shrink down, which is that if we are already in a lower state in the the true vacuum, you can have a fluctuation to the false vacuum. You can so you can go to a higher state, and that would create a bubble that would then disappear. Um, and so that one would go away. But if we're going from the higher state to the lower state, it always is going to expand in the same way that like if you. If you have a, a chain and you drop an end of the chain, it's pulling the rest of the chain down as it falls. It's similar to that with with the um, if if the if the um, decay starts here, it pulls the rest the the Higgs field near it down, so it, it kind of it cascades down. But if it goes to a higher state, like if you if you threw the chain up onto the table, it would fall down again. So if you if you wanted to go up, the bubble shrinks. But if you go down, it always grows. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Thank you. Let's give Katie a huge round of applause. <laughs> and I know we didn't have time for all the questions, but I think Katie's going to sign some books afterwards yeah. and can answer your questions there. Before we get to that, um, we, we promised you a raffle. So we're going to raffle off a few of these books. Um, so I'm going to actually ask Katie to pick one of these and, and hand it to okay. me. All right. Okay. All right. We have Victor Sukoski. And I think we're doing at least one more. Okay. All right. Uh, Kristen A. Corn, maybe? Ocor or corn? Kristen O'Kern? Yay! Can we get one more? One more. Okay, last one. All right. Sorry, this one is hard to read. Can you read it? It's the. Uh, oh, uh, the, the I should have written them. Ticket number is 13. Numbers. 13? Zero, zero. Zero 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 one three. There's a Stanford address. Christian, maybe. Maybe. Um, Who's got one three? Uh, uh, yeah, it looks like <laughs> it's very hard to read. <laughs> it could be. It could be Christian. It could be she saw. All right. Uh, well, look at look at your tickets. We have three two eight, three zero eight, and zero one three are the last three numbers. So if you have one of those numbers, you can come to Xenon and get a book. Xenon, do you have a final announcement? Okay. Well, thank you, Katie, for an awesome talk, and thank you, Risa. So for all of the uh, those who are joining us online, you will also see uh, a virtual raffle form on um, on the on the chat. Um, so we will do a separate raffle and directly reach out to you if you win. And of course, you know, uh, still copies of Katie's books. And um, before we go, I just wanted to say, well, thank you all very much for your time and bearing with us with um, all these technical difficulties. Um, so Pipac is actually offering these public lectures on a monthly basis. And uh, we are actually very excited to roll out the next mini series on the James Webb Space Telescope 
and all the early science that we have been doing at the KIPAC. So very exciting. Uh, the next public lecture is scheduled on Tuesday, October the 25th, um, and it's going to be on uh, distant galaxies and what we know about all those galaxies that we weren't able to see with the Hubble Space Telescope. So um, just uh, join us and I hope you had a great time here and feel free to stay hanging out. Um, can, I, oh, it's just, can I close my... Oh, of course. Uh, yeah, it's already... Yeah, it's already stopped.